Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your microphones off. Then if you have any question, you can open your mic and ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming Professor Shiva. Shiva is a professor of accounting at London Business School. He was formerly the subject area chair for the accounting, the accounting group at London Business School. His main research interests are in the the areas of financial reporting quality, stock return, and uh, micro accounting. He has, has he has uh, published articles in top ranking journal uh, in accounting and finance, uh, such as the Accounting Review, Journal of Accounting and Economics, Journal of Accounting Research, Review of Accounting Studies, Contemporary Accounting Research, Journal of Financial uh, Economics, the Journal of uh, Finance and uh, is or, or has been uh, a co-editor of the, the, uh, review, the review the review of accounting studies and the, the accounting review now we will start our seminar with professor shiva uh, thank you very much Mohamed. thanks for the introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to be here um so let me share the file with you first my presentation slides So today I want to be talking about, uh, um, but before I get into the paper itself, uh, let me also point out, I am not going to be able to keep track of uh, anything that is posted on the chat. So if you have um, any questions, please just unmute yourself and interrupt me with your voice. I'm not going to be able to see you put any signs on your videos either because I've got my uh, PowerPoint slides in front of me. Um, so I'm going to be presenting this particular paper, which is titled Shareholder Voting, a Complementary Mechanism to Mandatory Disclosure Regulation. It's a paper that I've written with Tatavet Mukhopadhyay, who's my former PhD student. So what do we do in this paper? We ask the question, can regulators somehow encourage corporations to improve transparency? In ways that are different to what we already know. We know that there are two ways that are currently popular with the regulators to encourage transparency. And the first of these is the voluntary disclosures. But when regulators ask firms to provide voluntary disclosures, they have no obligation to follow that. And so sometimes these requests go unneeded. And then the other alternative is for the regulators to mandate specific disclosures. But as we will soon see, there are also problems with mandatory disclosures. And there's lots of empirical evidence that shows that mandatory disclosures do not always achieve a reduction in asymmetric information across the users. So we are going to now propose a slightly different way, which is called, we are going to refer to this as an indirect regulatory approach to disclosures. And we are going to see whether this indirect, we are going to empirically test whether this indirect regulatory approach can elicit useful disclosures from firms that are above and beyond those that can simply be obtained through voluntary disclosures and mandatory disclosures. If firms can anyway going, if firms can disclose through mandatory disclosures or voluntary disclosures, and that's the same thing that we will achieve through indirect regulation, then this indirect regulation is not even needed. But we want to see whether it's incrementally beneficial over those two approaches. And what we are going to do is we are also going to evaluate this indirect approach to disclosure regulation by looking at a setting, which is the say on pay regulation. So we want to see how the say on pay can, is a good example of this indirect regulation. And we want to show that the adoption of the say on pay has actually been beneficial to firms, uh, beneficial in terms of encouraging firms to provide more information about their executive compensation packages. So let's start with what is the problem with the current approach to regulating disclosures? The first of these and the most common ones to regulate disclosures is the direct disclosure mandates. Under this approach, the SEC or any other regulator will simply tell the companies what all they need to disclose. And that information that's to be disclosed is decided by the regulators. So the regulators kind of have to step back, 
think what the users of that information need, then they will have to discuss it with the firms, whether they are providing such information, and then they decide what is the most appropriate amount of information that has to be disclosed by the firms under their regulation. But as many studies have previously shown, the quality of the disclosure is not just dependent upon mandating or rules, but the quality is often decided by the incentives that firms have to disclose such information. And mandatory regulation does not create incentives for firms to tailor their disclosures in a manner that is useful to the shareholders. As far as the mandatory disclosure approach is concerned, it just penalizes firms when they don't provide the appropriate disclosures. So the incentives that these mandatory disclosures, mandate, uh, the mandatory regulation then creates is merely compliance with what is needed by the law rather than what is the information that users require to make proper judgments with that information. And not only that, the regulation is going to provide only a limited upside to transparency. Once companies have met the minimum standards for that are needed to comply with the mandatory regulation, providing any more information is simply costly to the companies without any direct benefits that the firms might be getting out of adopting or following that particular mandate. So as a result, the mandatory regulation is not always successful in improving the transparency of companies. And lastly, yet another problem with the disclosures is the fact that the disclosures cannot distinguish between how much information is needed for, the, uh, for certain firms versus how much information is needed for certain types of investors, et cetera. It just gives the same requirement across all the firms. So what this means is if there are certain companies where there is greater need for information, or then the mandate is going to probably uh, not meet the need of that information from those firms. Similarly, if there are certain situations where users need a lot less information than what is mandated, then by forcing firms in those situations to also report the same level of information, the mandate is effectively imposing unnecessary cost on all these firms. So these are all the problems with the mandatory regulation, even before we talk about anything to do with enforcement of that regulation. Once we bring in enforcement, it just makes it even more uh, problematic because enforcement of direct disclosures is carried out by the regulators. But the regulators do not always have the right incentives to enforce all the regulation. And even if they have the incentives, they are constrained by the resources that are made available to them. Because by enforcing these regulations, the regulators are not getting a direct benefit. The benefits from enforcing the regulations are going to the investors. And the investors through the taxes that they pay and the allocation that the government makes to the enforcement gets a share of that benefit, which they then use to enforce these regulations. And the regulations through the, uh, the enforcement through regulations are also going to be affected by political influence. And that's what these papers by Kadia and Raj Gopal, as well as Maria Correa are showing that enforcement is not always perfect. So if you look at the empirical evidence on how direct disclosure mandates have proved to be, the results have been quite mixed. There are mandates which have achieved certain success, but there, are, but there are also anecdotal as well as empirical evidence that show that not all mandatory disclosures are followed the way they are expected to have been followed. So for instance, in the case of Ellis et al, they provide information saying that customer information is not provided by many companies in the way that is needed by the regulation. Similarly, Bhattacharya et al. look at information disclosures pertaining to um, fair value of derivatives, and they find that all the information that is required under the mandate 
are, pro are not provided by a large number of companies. So this approach of directly mandating disclosures of companies has its limitations. The other approach to providing disclosures or enticing disclosures out of firms is to ask the firms to voluntarily provide that information. And in the case of a voluntary disclosure mechanism, it's going to be dependent on the firm's trading off their cost of providing such disclosures against the benefits of providing the disclosures. It doesn't consider the overall desirability of providing that information. Firms are not going to consider, is it economically beneficial for everybody to have this disclosure? It's much more about what are my private costs versus what are my private benefits. And it's restricted to that specific trade-off. So as a result, even when disclosure can have spillover effects or there can be aggregate benefits associated with disclosures coming from all the firms, disclosures might still not happen if they are voluntarily, uh, you know, if they are left to the voluntary choice of the companies. The voluntary disclosures are also going to be clouded by managerial self-interest because it's much harder to enforce voluntary disclosures and because managers are going to be providing this, uh, such disclosures only when they benefit more than the cost that they will pay for it, they're also going to be very selective in what disclosures they tend to make. So these are the problems with voluntary disclosures. So given that mandatory disclosures are not as effective as the regulators would like them to be, and voluntary disclosures are, do not always work, so what is it that regulators can do further to entice or incentivize companies to provide more disclosures? And this is what we are going to suggest. And this approach we are going to suggest, we are referring to it as the indirect regulatory mechanism for disclosures. So under this indirect regulatory approach, we suggest that the regulators should ask firms to obtain a stakeholder voting on a specific corporate decision. So as soon as there is a stakeholder voting, and when I'm talking about stakeholder voting, it's primarily the shareholders voting that I'm talking about. Although this can be even extended beyond shareholder voting to situations such as uh, uh, bondholder vote, voting or even employee voting. But the idea is that there is a proposal that the management will have to place in front of the shareholders and shareholders will have to vote on that proposal. But what it does is because the management would like that proposal to be passed, the management has not got the onus in terms of explaining to the shareholders and making them understand why that proposal is in the best interest of the shareholders. So the onus now transfers to the managers in terms of deciding how much information to provide, what information to provide. And if they don't provide the needed information, then the shareholders are more likely to reject the management proposals. And if the management proposal is rejected, then the company might not be able to take on the specific corporate decisions that it wants to. And such corporate decisions might be like anything to do with acquiring a company. It could be to do with a compensation package that has been offered, et cetera. It could be any kind of a proposal. But if that proposal is rejected by the shareholders, then managers will have to either bear some reputational cost associated with it, or they might have to go for second best solutions or they might have to give up their pet projects or empire building activities, so on. So there are significant costs to the managers and the firm from not getting approval through this shareholder voting. Because of these costs, the management is going to now have the incentive to be very transparent to the shareholders to try and make them understand why it is optimal for the shareholders to vote in favor of that particular proposal. So effectively, this 
mechanism, the indirect regulatory mechanism works by linking the cost of non-disclosures to the outcome of the information that has been disclosed. So what do I mean by that? The outcome of the information that is disclosed in this particular setting is the, stack, is the stakeholder voting. And if companies do not provide appropriate information, then they are not going to get the outcome from the decisions. So rather than just looking at the decision inputs, like what, sorry, just looking at the disclosure inputs, such as what information is provided and in what detail it is provided, et cetera. Here, we are not even talking about the information that is provided for deciding whether it meets the standards. That decision for what information needs to be provided can be left to the firms, but if firms do not provide the right information, then the outcome of that information provision is going to be limited or it is going to cost the firm severely based on that outcome because the outcome is not going to be the one that is desired by the management or the firm. So in contrast to a mandate, a disclosure, um, disclosure dis direct disclosure regulations or disclosure mandates, where if a firm doesn't provide the needed information, it is penalized. Under this approach, the penalty happens if the information is not sufficiently transparent for shareholders to make the right to make the decisions on that proposal. So the cost of non-disclosure is now associated with the outcome of the disclosures rather than the disclosure itself. This creates incentives for the firms to not just tick boxes in terms of whether I have disclosed on information, but make sure that the information is provided in a manner that is useful for decision making. But at the same time, the indirect regulation offers a lot of advantages to the firms as well, because it doesn't tell the firm ex ante that this is what you need to provide. It allows a lot of flexibility to the firm. The firm can decide how much information it wants to provide based on how much demand there is for that information versus what is the cost of supplying that information. So and when they are talking about the cost of supplying that information, that cost could be the cost of actually generating that information, gathering that data, or it could be the cost associated with revealing some proprietary information about the firm's strategies. It could be that it could be the cost might be that greater disclosure, disclosures attract more litigation um, for the firm. Or it could be that more disclosures means that there's going to be more monitoring of managerial perk consumption, which could reduce the amount of perks that the managers are able to enjoy. So it doesn't matter what is the cost but there is a cost to supplying information or the cost to disclose, disclosing information. And what this indirect regulatory approach will allow companies to do is to make their individual decision on how much they want to provide based on this benefit cost trade uh, cost benefit trade-off. At the same time, this method also allows the firms the flexibility to choose not only just the quantity and the quality of the disclosures, but also how do they want to provide that disclosures? Do they want to make it available through um, some conference calls? Do they want to make it available through SEC filings? All those possibilities against exist. As a result, the effectiveness of the disclosures for utilization by the shareholders is going to be better under the indirect regulatory approach. Lastly, this indirect regulatory approach also doesn't need too much intervention from the regulators. Because at the end of it, the shareholders are getting the benefits. The shareholders are going to be the ones who will have the maximum incentives to make sure that the firm gives them all the needed information. And if the firm doesn't provide that information, that the investors can directly take such companies to the court to force them to provide more information. So the enforcement can happen through the investors themselves 
and there is lesser need for the regulators to get involved in the enforcement of the disclosures that are provided. Indirect regulatory approach also has its limitations. It may not always achieve, it may not always be feasible, first of all. Why might it not feasible? Because one of the things is, in order for that information to be disclosed, it needs to be something that is verifiable by the users and the users are willing to buy that. So in the sense, it cannot be subjective or cheap talk on the part of managers that are not verifiable. If the information that is disclosed to be disclosed for shareholder voting is highly subjective, then the users might completely ignore such information. And also indirect regulation may result in costs that are extremely large. And unless the cost associated with arranging for a shareholder voting is substantiated by the benefits associated with that voting, indirect regulation might not be the approach to go. It doesn't mean that the cost associated with the voting outcomes should be very small. In fact, it needs to be reasonably large so that the firms have an incentive to actually provide the needed information. Meaning, the issue at stake on which the shareholders are going to be voting has to be important to both the management and the shareholders so that if the voting doesn't go favorably, then the managers have to bear a cost. Similarly, it has to be important enough for the shareholders to want or demand more information. If it doesn't, if it's not meaningful at all, then the shareholders might just simply ignore such voting and they may not even take part in it. Lastly, for the indirect regulation to work, it works only when the stakeholders are large in number so that the company cannot have a private conversation with them. If the stakeholder voting is to be held with a small group of people, then the companies might find it much easier to talk or negotiate with them through private communication channels, and in which case there won't be any public disclosure of information. So these are all the limitations of the indirect regulatory approach. There are some benefits, but it doesn't always work in all situations and certain criteria are required to be met for the indirect regulatory approach to work. In reality, will it work? Uh, sure. that, yeah. I have one question before you move on. So here you said uh, all the information they provided has to be verifiable. But is that possible? The firm may disclose unnecessary information or oh, just trying to confuse investors because if you look at the behavior of finance, you know, there's a cost related to information process, right? So the more complex it is, and actually a lot of times the shareholder may just stop processing and... Yes, that's true. In the sense uh, it is possible for companies to provide more. And when I said that all information has to be verifiable, it has to be of a nature where an independent um, authority or body of people can verify it subsequently. Meaning it could be an auditor who is able to look at it and say, yes, the information provided is accurate. Because in the absence of accurate, uh, in the absence of verifiable information, investors might just simply not believe the disclosures to be credible and they could ignore all the information that has been provided. Yes, management can provide more information in order to make uh, obfuscate the infra, obfuscate the filings and make them uh, less relevant for the shareholders. But whatever the information they are providing, it needs to be verifiable for investors to be checking and making sure that yes, it is credible. But there are some information just basically cannot be verified, right? For example, when they talk about the risk, the 
projection of what they think about the industry trend. Right, but such information again is the kind of information for which disclosures associated with the indirect regulatory approach won't work simply because such disclosures are more likely to be of a voluntary nature. And, and I want to be careful there as well, because getting into the future, providing forecasts for the future might work if in the future you can still verify that the managers were accurately speaking. Even though you can't verify it at that specific point in time, future information can still be relevant if it can be subsequently verified that the management did not intentionally lie. That is, the, that is the key thing. It doesn't have to happen at the time of the proposal or at the time of the voting, but subsequently, if it is shown that the management was lying, then the management can be taken to the court and that could provide the disciplining mechanism for the management to say, yes, I've got to be honest now, because I know that these numbers will be tested subsequently. And uh, that's, that's slightly, in, it goes into another theory that is out there in terms of the complementarity between mandated disclosures and voluntary disclosures. But for our purposes here, what is more important is the fact that it needs to be verifiable either now or in the future. Okay. All right. Continue, thank you. Okay. Um, so, the empirical setting that we are looking at is uh, to test the indirect regulation is the say on pay voting that was introduced in the US by SEC in 2011. What the say on pay voting requires is, it, what it requires or mandates firms to do is to hold a non-binding vote on executive compensation. It's not binding in the sense that whether shareholders accept the executive compensation that is put up for voting or whether they reject it, the firm doesn't have to take that. The firm doesn't have to do anything in terms of responding immediately to the shareholders. Although subsequently, if the shareholders do disprove, disapprove the executive compensation, all that is needed is for the firm to explain to the shareholders why they are not going to do anything about it, or if they are going to do something about it, they just need to explain, explain it to the shareholders. This voting has to be held once every three years at the annual general meetings. And companies can choose what periodicity they want their voting to be in. They can either choose it to be one year, two years, or three years, but it cannot be more than three years. And the results of the SOP vote have to be publicly announced within four business days of the AGM meeting. So effectively what the say on pay voting has done for the firms is now the firms and its board of directors have to defend the compensation practices for their executives to the shareholders. They need to explain to the shareholders as to why they came up with that specific executive compensation package and what was the reasons why they justified the particular pay that was given to the, execu the senior executives in the company. The idea behind the say on pay is that if there are a sufficient number of shareholders who disagree with the executive compensation package and as a result vote against the package, then the firms will take these uh, inputs into consideration in terms of reformulating or changing the executive compensations appropriately, or at least provide more disclosures to the shareholders to be able to better understand what is the logic behind the specific executive compensation package that has been chosen. So how effective has the SOP been? The empirical evidence on this issue is unfortunately mixed. There have been some studies such as the Korea and Lil paper, which shows that after SOP was adopted in various countries, it's just not the US which has adopted it. Many countries adopted it before the US and other countries and some countries have even adopted it afterwards. But effectively looking at it across countries, what Korea and Lil found is that 
countries adopting the SOP saw lower great growth rates in the CEO compensation compared to countries that did not adopt the SOP laws. So they claim that SOP is effective in curtailing compensation growth. There is another paper by Iliev and uh, Vitanova where they looked at, again, what happened to the compensation levels after the SOP adoption. And surprisingly, they find that the cash-based performance, the level of the CEO pay actually increased to compensate the CEO for the greater risk associated with these shareholder voting. And they find that the fraction of the performance link pay also increased after the SOP. Kunad Jean and Guadalupe, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that name properly. They also looked at the efficiency gained through the SOP voting, and they find that SOP voting actually improved the market value of the firms. But Kai and Walken, when they look at the governance aspects of SOP voting, they found that the SOP voting actually created value for companies only with weak governance or those that were having excessive compensation. But in all other cases, the SOP voting was actually destroying value. So as a result, whether SOP has been effective or not has been a relatively mixed bag. The SOP is costly to the firms and to the boards. And this is important for my particular setting here because we need the shareholder voting for the indirect regulation to work, to be costly to the firms and the boards for them to take that voting seriously. And in this particular case, there is evidence that SOP voting has been costly to the firms. So for instance, typically if companies receive a disapproval voting, then there's a lot of media coverage associated, negative media coverage associated with, with such SOP vote disapprovals. There is also evidence to suggest that litigation has increased after the SOP adoption. And there are also studies which have shown that directors' market, job market prospects are affected if there is SOP voting disapproval. So the SOP has direct cost to both the board of directors and to the firms. And consistent with these costs being significant, Larker, McCall, and Ormus Ball, what they show is that SOP voting, that firms go to a, a lot of, uh, they take a lot of actions in order to obtain the SOP votes. So for instance, they actually make the compensation programs much more in line, uh, in line with what the proxy advisors require these firms to have. Even, they, even though they might be suboptimal for the firm, they find that the SOP voting adoption has caused firms to change their behavior. Similarly, there are papers by Eritmer et al. and Cotter et al. where they find that SOP failures cause firms to engage more with shareholders as well as with proxy advisory firms. So it's quite clear from the anecdotal as well as empirical evidence that SOP votes are important to boards and to firms. And so naturally, this is a setting where if there is an indirect uh, effect on disclosures, we should be able to observe it. So there are multiple advantages to focus on, focusing on the say on pay voting setting in order to tease out how effective indirect regulatory approach to disclosures are going to be. First of all, the indirect regulatory approach, um, first of all, before the SOP was adopted in 2011, the SEC for a very long time has been trying to encourage and incentivize firms to provide more disclosures. And it has also mandated disclosures at various points in time regarding the company's compensation packages. So for instance, in 1992, the SEC required companies to provide a detailed summary of the various components of pay that was provided to the executives, to the CEOs and other senior executives. Then in 2006, 
the SEC came and enhanced these disclosure requirements because in before the 2000 before 2006 in early 2000 there was a lot of financial um, financial misreporting and fraud that had happened which media as well as academics had attributed to the wrong kind of uh, incentives that were created by the compensation packages for the CEOs and senior executives. So the SEC had to be seen as doing, uh, as taking some action on the executive compensation. And as part of that, they made, they introduced in 2006, a regulation called as regulation SK, which required that companies provide a separate section called as Com uh, compensation disclosure and analysis, CD and A. And in this CD and A discussion, the companies had to provide details about what was the performance metrics that were used in the compensation packages, what was the targets, if possible to mention how much was achieved of those targets so that the shareholders get a much better understanding of how the compensation package was decided what was the reasoning behind its specific form that it had taken and what were the factors that decided ultimately how much was going to be paid out to the executives. So the regulation SK requires all this information to be provided in definitive proxy statements, which is what is the form DEF 14A. And this has to be filed before every AGM, uh, particularly the AGMs um, where the SOP voting is to be held. Um, these requirements were quite controversial. So even though the, the SEC had mandated these requirements, these requirements had elicited nearly 20,000 comment letters with many companies objecting to this provision of detailed information. And the problem arose because Compensation packages are often linked to strategic performance measures that firms are using. And the closer the link between the strategic choices that the companies are making and the compensation packages, the harder it is for the firms to disclose it to the outside world because of proprietary cost. So that's one of the reasons why these requirements for greater disclosure were quite controversial, but nonetheless, the SEC went ahead with it, but allowed companies to be able to redact information whenever the companies felt that the information was going to be uh, proprietary in nature. The advantage of this SOP setting for testing the indirect regulatory approach arises from the fact that because these mandated disclosures were already in place, Later on, when the SOP voting was introduced, it now allows us to test whether the SOP voting incrementally contributed to the disclosures, meaning that SOP voting by itself is just not the reason for the disclosures, but rather the disclosures have been happening. And what we are going to see with the SOP is incremental to anything that was mandated. And this is the kind of thing that we want to achieve because we don't want to simply get the same uh, disclosures that we would get under the mandated disclosures. If that was the case, we don't need indirect regulation. We can simply rely upon mandated disclosures. The second advantage with having previously mandated disclosures before the SOP adoption is that we are now able to costly attribute the increases observed after the SOP mandate to the indirect regulatory approach rather than to other incentives of firms. And it also mitigates any concerns that the disclosures associated with the SOP mandates are simply basic or minimalistic that are often associated with any voting. So that's the other advantage here. There are lots of other advantages. So SOP actually provides a very unique setting to be able to test this indirect regulatory approach. First, the SOP rules 
did not require any additional direct disclosures. So any changes in the disclosure behavior that we see after the SOP rules were introduced can be attributed to the SOP rules directly. The disclosures were important as we have already spoken. So both the firms as well as the shareholders are going to take these, um, they are going to take these seriously. For the shareholders, the SOP voting was introduced because of demand from the investors for more information about the compensation packages. So as a result, they are also going to be taking these voting seriously. And as the SOP votes are required of all firms, we are not going to have concerns with the selection bias, which we might have had if we look at other types of stakeholder voting, such as stakeholder voting on acquisition uh, decisions, on governance related issues um, or, on, uh, strict, or on other types of uh, corporate uh, decisions. So in all these cases, companies do not necessarily have a SOP voting regularly. They will arise one, whenever there is a specific event associated with that shareholder voting. So in our particular case, we don't have that, uh, that concern. And yet another advantage of the SOP setting is that we know what kind of disclosures are crucial for investors to be able to evaluate the compensation packages and to vote in these SOP uh, voting. And one of the key inputs needed to evaluate the compensation packages is the KPIs of the companies, the performance metrics on which the compensation packages are based. So we can actually identify those disclosures they are more and come up with some standardized measure metric of that compensation uh, of those performance metrics to be able to compare it over time as well as compare it across firms. In the case of event specific shareholder voting, such standardized measures of disclosures are much harder to come by. Lastly, the SOP rules are also going to affect each firm differently because the SOP rules are not going to be more, are not going to be very constraining or binding in terms of disclosure needs for firms that are not having excessive packages, pay packages. But in contrast, for companies which are not currently able to explain their executive pay packages with observable characteristics, in those cases, the say on pay rule is going to have a much stronger impact in terms of the firm's incentives to provide additional disclosures because they have a greater demand from investors to understand their executive compensation packages. So these lead us to our main hypotheses. We have three major hypotheses. The first of these hypothesis is to do with how say on pay voting changes the disclosure incentives for firms. Firms' optimal compensation packages are going to be closely tied to the firm's strategic decisions. But ironically, closer the link between the strategy of the company and closer and the compensation that is offered to the executives, the more costly it becomes to reveal all that information. So before the SOP was introduced, companies would have been trading off, should have providing the proprietary information or disclosing too much information, which could even reveal per consumption or excessive uh, executive rent that was being taken in the form of high packages or uh, high pay packages. And so they might have curtailed the amount of disclosures that they were providing earlier. Providing more disclosures at that particular point before the SOP was introduced did not bring in as much benefit as it brought after the SOP voting was required. Once the SOP voting was required, the benefit associated with disclosures increases because if the firms did not provide that information, then they might get a lot of unwanted media coverage and press coverage from failing their SOP voting. 
So the SOP voting changes the incentives of firms to provide more information about their executive packages. But SOP adoption need not mechanically increase the disclosures. The disclosures will only go up if the earlier direct disclosure mandates were not fully effective. Meaning, if the earlier disclosure mandates, such as the regulatory SK, was already creating the right incentives for firms to disclose all the relevant information, then there isn't anything incremental for the companies to disclose after the SOP has been adopted because all the information is anyway in the public um, domain and the SOP is simply going to use that publicly available data for shareholders to vote upon the executive compensation packages. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, I actually hard for me to understand why uh, this disclosure impact will only go one way because I can see sometimes when you discuss more, may actually lead to a failed SOP vote. That's right. If that is the case, because there is management is less likely to provide all the bad news here. They are going to be selective in terms of the disclosures that they are going to be providing. It, it, it's actually not also it has to be bad news, right? I mean, if you think about this compensation structure, uh, basically it's incentive based um, towards the more fixed compensation style. So incentive right. based a lot of time to do with how you think the stock price will behave. I'm just thinking about if you are a company, say you are a pharmaceutical company, you know very well, better than outside investor, the likelihood of success of certain patents or the drugs. So then you may actually time or your, the way you structure your compensation, you know, sometimes more incentive based, what's less, less incentive based. And you can just withhold information because nobody can tell you know or you don't know. Exactly. Absolutely, that's, that's precisely the reason why we believe that if you provide more information, that information will be selectively provided only when they benefit the firm to achieve a better SOP voting. Otherwise, they will just be told that information. So even the SOP might not actually, that's the other point, SOP might not actually encourage any disclosures. If by providing more disclosures, I'm going to actually uh, reduce the percentage of votes that are in favor of the SOP voting. In such case, I'll just keep quiet. I'll just provide the same information that was there earlier. Am I making sense here? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I will come back later to you because I, when I read your paper, I was a little bit uh, not quite sure why the direction will only go one way, not another. But while we are on that, I don't mind. Do you have a reason why management might actually reveal a lot of information which might actually hurt it? Why do you think that might come about? Because well, remember, under the same take, it's that they have already been providing the disclosures required as per the mandated disclosure requirements. So any additional disclosures that they are going to make for specifically after the say on pay or all, say on pay are all voluntary in nature. So can you think of a situation where they might actually voluntarily provide more information but end up hurting themselves? Like what I said, it can come from the demand of the shareholder, right? When you have very sophisticated shareholder, they maybe they know what kind of information they are looking for, and they know you are withholding it. So you see what I mean? It depends on who is asking for the information. I see, okay, fair enough. Good point, okay, so thank you. I agree, okay, so that could be the case, yes. If there is that demand, they might provide it, but my guess on those cases is as well, if they, have, they will just simply say, Sorry, we are not providing that information. We don't require to do that. Okay, and we will see some examples. 
but but that's an empirical question. I agree with you. That's just uh, my prior. It could go either way. Uh, I can give you another example. Say, for example, if your competitor is providing, and then you have to, right? Fair enough. Taken. Your point is well taken. Okay, so good. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, the question? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, actually, the question is related with uh, a pre-early raised question. So by adopting SOP, uh, uh, we, we may have uh, financial information that should be disseminated uh, for the users. So uh, would you infer us uh, how much reliability uh, of those financial information that were disclosed by uh, uh, the uh, shareholders. So how much can we trust the reliability of those financial information that were disclosed by um, the shareholders? Sorry, I'm, I'm missing that point. Can you make it again? Can you tell me? Yeah, how much can we trust on the reliability issue of financial information that were disseminated or disclosed uh, via a director's executive uh, compensation. Okay, um, so this is a question of how much trust is there, not something that we directly look at, but we look at much more about whether, whether investors use that information for making voting decisions. Okay? So if you are to see that as being effectively trusting the data, then it does, our evidence does show that the investors are trusting the data that the management is providing. Okay, uh, do you think that uh, uh, providing executive compensation or a director's compensation is the only way to mandatory disclosure? This is not even mandatory disclosure. Um, what, what other ways, I'm sorry, can you explain it further? Uh, is there any relationship between executive compensation and uh, uh, mandatory disclosure? There are lots of mandatory disclosures that are required associated with the executive uh, disclosures, uh, with the executive compensation. Okay, uh, I mean just uh, uh, giving them a compensation or encouraging them with a consequential benefit uh, may uh, force them to disclose uh, the financial information or disseminate the financial inf uh, information. Even you were uh, actually inferring or sharing uh, the ideas that were creative ideas. So uh, I may get the point uh, in a coming screenshots. Uh, so continue, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm not. I'm not quite sure where you're going at, but we can. Maybe you can talk about it afterwards. All right. Sure. sure. So, so let's get to the hypothesis again. Um, so with the hypothesis. So basically with the SOP adoption, we expect that the SOP adoption will induce greater disclosures if the earlier direct mandates were not fully effective or if the cost of providing the additional disclosures, which could mean as much as, which could also include um, getting negative SOP uh, voting or getting less, sorry, not negative, getting a lower SOP voting or SOP vote disapprovals, then the benefit associated with the provision of such disclosures. So both these conditions have to be satisfied if the SOP is going to induce an incremental disclosure compared to what was needed under the earlier, um, under the earlier regime, which was just purely mandated disclosures. Would the SOP disclosures be credible? And that's a question that we, can answer, uh, we are going to answer empirically. But there is theoretical literature which points out that even when managers have an incentive to be biased in their selection, namely that they want to provide only the good information to the investors and withhold bad information, then even in such situations, the provision of information can be done credibly to the investors. And that's what the Dai and the Verikia um, models show. So we are going to look at this empirically and find and look at whether the disclosures associated with the SOP adoption rules are informative for shareholders. 
We are also going to be making the claim that this SOP, this SOP adoption will affect firms differently. As we spoke about earlier, firms that have got excessive pay and are not able to explain that excessive pay using the current, using their disclosures, these are the firms that are going to be under a greater pressure after the SOP rule adoption to provide more information. So as a result, our first hypothesis is that the firms, especially those with seemingly excessive pay packages, will provide greater compensation relevant disclosure in the proxy statements after the SOP mandate has been adopted. Looks like there are a couple of chat comments. Uh, okay. So our second hypothesis relates to the first one, but looks at a specific context. And that context is what happens when firms receive an against recommendation from one of the major proxy advisors. And this major proxy advisors that we are going to consider is the ISS. There is studies which have shown that ISS against recommendations decrease the SOP voting by as much as 25 percentage points. And Eritma et al. also showed that stock prices react a lot more to surprises in ISS recommendations, but not the recommendations from the other proxy advisors. So because ISS is such an important player in the SOP voting, we are going to look at what happens when a firm receives an ISS against recommendation. Our hypothesis is that when the firm receives a recommendation that increases the likelihood of a SOP vote dissent, then it creates more incentives to disclose and better explain the compensation that has been avoided by the, that has been awarded by the firms. So in this case, what we are saying is for the firms that are receiving the ISS against recommendations, we are more likely to see them file additional proxy materials. And these additional proxy materials will also contain more compensation relevant information. In other words, this SOP voting, in order to be able to narrow down the fact that the disclosures are all arising from the incentives created by the SOP voting, we are able to focus on these firms that are the ISS against firms. And so we are able to say that in this sample of firms where there is the greatest incentive to increase the disclosures, we should observe a substantial or disproportionately larger change in the disclosures after the ISS against recommendation has been made. And our second part of our hypothesis is that this increased disclosure that is made after an ISS against recommendation should be informative for the investors to vote in favor of the SOP voting outcomes. So that's our second hypothesis. Our third hypothesis is very similar to the second one, except that instead of focusing on just the case of ISS against recommendation, we look at what happens to companies that have failed one set of SOP voting, what happens to them in the next SOP or the subsequent SOP voting. Our argument is that, our argument is that firms which have failed the SOP voting once are likely to face greater monitoring and they are going to get greater attention from ISS in the subsequent SOP voting. As a result, these firms are under a greater pressure to better explain their executive compensation packages to the investors prior to the second SOP voting. So as a result, what we are claiming is for the failed firms, that is the, fail, the firms that failed to receive shareholders approval in one SOP voting, 
we should see that their compensation related disclosures increase in the subsequent SOP voting and that this increased SOP disclosures, SOP related disclosures should actually have an effect on the SOP voting by investors subsequently. So that's our third hypothesis. And we take these three hypotheses to the data. How do we test our hypotheses? In order to be able to test the hypothesis, first of all, we need some standardized measure of disclosure. And we are going to specifically focus on disclosures of key performance indicators, KPIs. The key performance indicators have an important role in helping investors understand whether the executive remuneration is appropriate and whether, sub, whether the right kinds of incentives for the management is being created by the executive uh, compensation packages. This performance metric is so important. That is why that almost in every context, when people talk about SOP voting, there is a lot of emphasis given to these key performance indicators. For instance, the regulation SK, which was mandating disclosures uh, relating to the executive compensation, required firms to actually disclose the KPIs based on which the compensation is being awarded. The ISS proxy advisory firm also places these KPIs at the top of a list that it has got, which it uses for evaluating how transparent the firm's compensation disclosures are. And there was a survey that was conducted by Larker and Tayan of institutional investors. And in that survey, they found that 62% of the institutional investors claim to rely on the performance metrics for their SOP voting decisions. Because this performance metric plays such an important role in the SOP voting, we are going to specifically focus on how firms disclose these KPIs. And we are going to come up with a standardized measure of the key performance indicators. How are we going to measure, uh, come up with this key performance indicator disclosure, KPI disclosure metric? For that, we are going to parse through all the SEC filings and pick out KPIs that match with key performance indicator names that are provided to us in the balanced scorecard framework. So we need a dictionary to identify the KPIs from, and our KPIs are going to be, the dictionary from where we are going to search for those KPIs is coming from the balanced scorecard framework. What, this, what is the advantage of focusing on the balanced scorecard? We don't need to decide ex ante. We don't need to use any subjective methods to decide what should be the appropriate performance metric. And that is why we rely upon this balanced scorecards. We don't, we don't need to come up with the list ourselves. We then count the total number of times that the KPIs are used in each of the individual SEC filing. We are specifically going to look at the form DEF 14A, which is the proxy material, the first proxy material, as well as an amendment to that proxy, which is the DEF A 14A. So this is the amendment to a proxy material. So we are going to look at how many KPIs are present in each of these filings, and then we will standardize or scale that total number of KPIs that are present in a filing by the total number of words in that filing. So our metric for the KPI is a relative metric. It's relative to the size of the proxy material. So it also controls for how complex that proxy material is or how complex or how large that company is, et cetera. The count measure that we come up with is relatively simplistic, but it has a lot of advantages in that it captures the breadth of the KPIs. How many different KPIs are being disclosed in the compensation disclosures? It also measures the depth of the disclosures, meaning it provides, it takes into account how detailed the company gets into each of the KPIs. 
And lastly, it also gets into the granularity of the KPI disclosures. The granularity, by granularity, we mean you provide the KPI disclosures across all executives or across groups of executives or for separately for each of the executives. So this comp measure is going to encompass a wide type, a wide variety of disclosure qualities. While both financial and non-financial KPIs are important to evaluate the compensation related disclosures, it's hard to isolate the disclosure effects associated with financial KPIs simply because they are very ubiquitous. They are reported in a variety of contexts. And so we can't narrow them to the specific KPI disclosures associated with compensation evaluation or the SOP voting. And that's the reason why we are going to restrict our analysis to just non-financial KPIs. Although our results are very similar if we also include the financial KPIs in our analysis. Hi, uh, yeah. Before we move on, I have a question. So this KPI, how sticky it is? Because I can think about some information, like talk about the risk, then the outside investor cannot tell you have information or not, right? But for KPI, if you are playing this repeated game, I mean, do, shouldn't they notice you didn't disclose this time compared to last time? Who shouldn't, who shouldn't understand? Like I said, KPI is essentially it's a measure, right? So like yeah, say you provide a number of key measures this period, then people right. will assume you should continue like this period because this is not something people, people know you have information, right? So this is not like the one for disclosure. People don't know you have information or not. Um, but they don't know whether the KPI is relevant for the compensation package anymore or not. They don't know whether the strategic focus of the company has changed from the KPI or KPI. True, true. But the right. thing is, if it's a repeated game, yeah. I just don't see that a huge variation goes up and down. If this is a information, everyone knows you have information, you, you could disclose. There is, there is quite a bit of time variation in the KPI disclosures. And the KPI disclosure time variation can come about uh, either from companies themselves becoming more uh, willing to provide information, or it could come from uh, companies making their packages a lot broader in terms of covering more compensation packages. Uh, it could come from companies changing their underlying uh, strategic focus. It could come from companies changes in uh, turnover of the senior management, so on. So it comes from a variety of factors, but there is quite a bit of, uh, it is persistent, okay? So I'm not saying it's not persistent, but it's not extremely persistent to, um, to subsume all time variation. In I, fact, I, our analysis I completely are controlled. agree. I completely so, agree. But I think from an investor point of view, this is a, essentially there are two types of voluntary disclosure, right? So one type of disclosure, people don't know you have information or not. So uh, there's a lot of inside information there. The second type, everyone knows you have information, but is you decide you to disclose or not. So depending on how sophisticated the outside investor it is. I mean, if they are sophisticated enough, they can ask you to disclose KPI every single period. But if then, they may choose not to because they think they're not important. You see what I'm getting here? I was trying to yeah, speak out what- Yeah, I do, I do but, but I think you're taking, you're trying to take the die and the very key paper directly when you talk about them, that they don't have that information. The equivalent of that, not having the information in this particular setting is, much more about not have not be, not having that disclosure being no longer relevant. Okay, so that is the way to interpret that no information kind of a uh, setting in the Dai and Verikia models. So I still think that they are applicable here, except that you have to see that no information slightly differently. All right. Then could you give me an example? Say if I'm an investor. Okay. I'm sophisticated enough. I understand there are some key information. Then why don't I ask you to disclose, especially if you disclosed it before, unless I don't uh, think it's important. 
Okay, so I'll give you sometimes uh, what companies tend to do is they also include performance metrics associated with for performance metric for head of Asia. Okay. But the next year, they tend to define their segments, geographic segments differently. They probably don't have Asia anymore. They probably have combined Asia and Europe and they brought and they have restructured it to have uh, everything as US versus non-US. And then they are going to provide a new set of performance metrics. It's for the same person now, rather than head of Asia, he has become the head of, he or she has become the head of non-US uh, uh, activities. And the performance metrics associated with that are going to be different. True, but if investors want to know, they can still. They won't. Companies won't do that. They'll simply say, sorry, we are not providing that information anymore. And they are not ob obligated to do it. And I've seen situations like that as well. Uh, so, so what type of in investor you're talking about? I saw that here we talk about a really big institutional investor. Yeah, even if the institutional investors are asking for that information, They'll simply say, sorry, we have restructured ourselves differently. We don't gather that information or we don't want to make that information public. Yes, but that cannot be a repeated game, right? I mean, I understand what you said, but yeah. this one you do every single period. I can't see that it happen once or twice, but it cannot. Absolutely, that's all that's needed. So for time variation, we just need a little bit of variation in it. We are not saying that this number jumps from five to 25 and then comes down to six and then next year it's 45, nothing like that. The variation are a little bit, okay? So if it was three, it goes to four, maybe five, next year it comes to four, then it's at seven, it comes down to six, so on. That's the variation you're talking about, okay? okay. So for want of time, let me move on on this. So in terms of uh, our research design, we are going to test our hypothesis H1 using a difference in difference regression approach whereby our dependent variable is the KPI disclosures. It's the count of the KPI disclosures scaled by the, scaled by the total number of birds in the proxy materials. We are going to regress that on what is going to be our measure of excessive pay, which is the residual pay after controlling for observable performance metrics. We get this residual pay using a model that was um, that's based out of the core et al study. So we are not going to compute it ourselves, but we just take it from the core et al model. And whatever is the residual from the, that is unexplained by the core et al model is what is called as the residual pay. A higher number for residual pay means that pay is excessive relative to observable characteristics. And then we have got post times residual pay where post takes the value one for the periods after 2011. That is when the SOP adoption was introduced. If SOP adoption made the firms, incentivized the firms to increase their disclosures on the KPIs, we should find this alpha two coefficient to be significantly positive. And to provide some corroborative tests, we are also going to do parallel trends analysis to ensure that this coefficient alpha two is relatively stable in the post period relative to what it was in the pre period, which is what is captured by alpha one. We are also going to do a placebo analysis that swaps the KPI disclosures with KPI that is disclosed in the 10K rather than in the proxy materials. We are going to test hypothesis H2, which pertains to firms that have received an ISS against recommendation. So we are going to see whether firms that have got an ISS against recommendation, which is captured by this indicator variable, offer more filings. That is, they are more likely to file an amendment to the proxy materials. That's the DEF A14A filing. And conditional on those firms filing that amendment material, we are going to see whether the amendment material is more likely to contain KPI disclosures if the firm received an ISS against 
as compared to firms that did not receive an ISS against recommendation. If firms are responding to the ISS against recommendation, we expect the beta one in the first regression and alpha one in the second regression to be significantly positive. Uh, hi, Shiva. I have a yeah. question. Uh, sure. It's an institutional question. So, yeah. what happened to, to the compensation package if they if the firm receive uh, against from ISS? Pardon me. I mean, what happened to that compensation structure if they receive against? Do they have to restructure it? They can't restructure because the compensation package, that's in fact one of the strengths of this setting is you can't go back and restructure the compensation package because the companies first provide their proxy statements. The ISS evaluates the proxy statements and comes up with its recommendations for whether that proxy material disclosures as well as the compensation packages are optimal for investors. It makes its recommendation. And then the firm can now come back and say, okay, now we are providing you more disclosures, but they can't go back and say, now for last year, we are going to now change our executive compensation packages. Okay. So in that sense, it's a much cleaner setting to understand what is happening on account of the additional materials that are being provided. Okay. We are going to then go and see whether the information that is in the additional filings, that is your KPIs provided in uh, the proxy materials, in the, sorry, there's the KPIs provided in the additional proxy materials, that's the KPI add materials, whether that actually makes it less likely for companies to get, in, get an against vote. If our hypothesis is correct, we expect beta three to be negative. The same hypothesis, but by replacing that percentage of against vote with an indicator for whether it was a dissent vote or not, where the dissent vote is based on whether at least 70% of the shareholders were in favor of the vote or not. Using that indicator variable, we again replicate a similar analysis. And in that analysis, we expect the coefficient on alpha three, which is the KPI additional materials provided by the ISS against firms. If they are more informative, we expect alpha three to be significantly negative. Our last set of hypotheses relate to firms that have failed one SOP voting, and we are going to look at what happens in the subsequent SOP voting. So we first check whether the KPI disclosures increase. And for that, we relate the past descent, an indicator for past descent against what was the change in the KPI disclosures at the next or the subsequent SOP voting. If firms increase their disclosing, disclosures following a failed SOP voting, we expect beta one to be significantly positive. And similarly, if those increased KPI disclosures led to a less likelihood of a subsequent pro, uh, dissent vote, we expect this beta one to be negative. I'm going to skip this uh, sample and the descriptive statistics. Um, Quickly, the sample consists of effectively 7,423 SOP voting uh, period, uh, voting observations covering the period from January 2011 to December 2016. But our difference in differences approach uses the sample from January 2007 to December 2016. So what do we find? When we run these difference in difference regressions, which is the test of hypothesis H1, we find that in the pre-period, the excessive pay was unrelated to the KPI disclosures. So before the SOP was introduced, firms did not have incentives to increase their KPI disclosures if they were having, even if they were having excessive pay packages. But this changes after the SOP mandate was introduced. In the post period, there is a significantly positive relation 
between the KPI disclosures and the residual packages, meaning firms which are seemingly having excessive pay packages were more likely to increase their disclosures in the post period after the SOP adoption. When we do a parallel trends analysis, we find that in the post period, there is a consistent, almost a constant, consistently positive effect on the disclosures for firms which have excessive pay packages. And for all our periods, pre-periods, we find that there is no significant relation between the excessive pay packages and KPI disclosures. So this suggests that the increase in KPI disclosures is relatively permanent and it exists for several years after the SOP was adopted. So it's not a one-off increase that comes back down again after the SOP was introduced. When we replace the KPI disclosures in the proxy statements with KPI disclosures that are provided in the annual reports, we find there is no change in those KPI disclosures. So this, is, this change in KPI disclosures is not happening due to something else that happened around 2011, whereby firms were providing more and more KPI disclosures, but rather the disclosures are specific in nature to what is disclosed in the proxy materials. So it gives us more confidence to be able to say that the disclosures, increased disclosures are associated with the SOP adoption. We then test our hypothesis H2. Uh, before, by, yeah. before you, I think you probably get this question before. I mean, I, how, you know, 2011, there's so many things going on. And for example, Dark Frank, how can you attribute that to the SOP, the effect? Um, so around this time, how can I attribute it to the SOP effect when Dark Frank was also happening? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is possible that there is something else driving these results, but what gives us confidence are the, is the fact that if it was something else like the dot franc, we should have expected the KPI disclosures to have actually increased in the annual reports, not in the compensation discussion and analysis. Okay. okay. So the fact that we are noticing the changes only in the compensation discussion and analysis tells us that this is likely to be associated with the SOP voting mandate. Even then I take it, it might be that there was something else that happened around the SOP voting mandate, which changed the incentives for companies to provide KPI disclosures. And that something else must have also been related to firms receiving excessive pay because we are focusing primarily on how the disclosures changed for firms with excessive pay packages. Okay. But it's possible. But that's there's, why, yeah. There's a related regulation, it's about the crawlback, right? So the firms, uh, they started to voluntarily adopt the crawlback too, which is also related to compensation. So maybe yeah, but I, don't, I don't think the clawback, if I remember right, the clawback provisions were adopted much before 2011. Okay, I think if I remember right, it was more like 2009 or something around that period. Okay. I could be wrong. I'm just speaking out of uh, my memory, memory, but it wasn't in 2011. Okay. And it, maybe the clawback provision could have, as I said, like, look, the clawback provision for some reason was correlated with firms with excessive pay packages. And somehow, I don't know what would be the incentive for clawback provisions to come up with KPI disclosures, but it's possible. Okay. I'm not ruling them out. That is yeah, why we're actually going the into... Rhythm I mentioned yeah. it because I know Dr. Frank is the one make a crawlback become a mandatory because before that is a voluntary. So that, that can have an impact. Okay, but okay, but as I said, like look, I don't know whether it needs to be associated with KPI disclosures, but all said and done, yes, something else could be happening. And that is precisely the reason why we are narrowing it down to what happens around ISS against recommendations because these ISS recommendations are specific to the SOP voting. And what we are going to do is, we are going to look at how firms respond to that ISS 
against recommendations. Okay? And there we find that firms which have got an ISS against recommendation are more likely to file a proxy amendment. So they're going to have additional proxy statement filing, which is your diff A14A. And not only that, if you take the firms that are providing that additional uh, materials, those firms which have an ISS against are likely to include more KPI disclosures in that specific uh, additional material. So this is again saying that the say on poor pay voting is incentivizing the firms that have the biggest benefit from disclosures to encourage them or incentivize them to provide more KPI related disclosures. And these results hold whether we include in it a variety of control variables, uh, whether we have fixed effects, et cetera. Given that they are providing more materials, the next step is to check whether this provision of increased materials are informative for the shareholders in making their SOP voting decisions. And we find that companies, the IS companies which have increased their uh, KPI disclosures in the additional materials are less likely to get an against vote. So in spite of them getting ISS against recommendation, if they provide more disclosures in the additional materials in response to the ISS recommendation, they are less likely to get an against vote. And similarly, they're also less likely to get a dissent vote. But this happens only for the disclosure information provided subsequent to the ISS response. If you had looked at the relation with the information provided before the ISS response, the KPI disclosures there are not sufficient to affect the outcomes of the SOP voting. So this again narrows down the information to be able to say, yes, it is the SOP voting that is creating the incentives for firms to provide greater disclosures and that those disclosures are informative for investors to make a voting decision. Shiva, I wonder, yeah. could you, write, I mean, expand or generalize what you get here? Is that every time you get an ISS against, really against anything, will you expect you see an increase in disclosure? Um, I don't want, I want to be careful about uh, expanding it to the wider, uh, to the wider uh, set of uh, voting, shareholding voting that vote, that takes place because I haven't seen it. Okay, I can only speculate that it might happen, but I don't want to generalize it um, because I don't know. I don't have the evidence for it. Okay. I wonder, could you, I don't know, it's, uh, like uh, provide some anecdotal evidence to really show me like what kind of disclosure you're talking about? Uh, the link, like say, if there's a rejection, then you see an increase. If you could actually just provide like an example for one firm in reality, that would be really uh, helpful. I think our paper actually has a specific uh, links to def A14A to show those kinds of things. But if it is not, we can include it in the paper. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the last set of analysis, I'm running out of time. Uh, so the last set of analysis looks at firms that have failed the SOP voting. And what we find is if a company had failed its SOP voting in the past, so it had a past dissent, which was one, or even if you take the continuous percentage against received in the past, we find that those firms are more likely to increase KPI disclosures in the subsequent SOP voting. And these increased KPI disclosures, the change in KPI disclosure from the past SOP to the current SOP are actually helpful in mitigating a subsequent dissent vote for these firms. So overall, our results seem to support the view that stakeholder voting can improve disclosures that are incremental to those obtained through just 
disclosure mandates themselves. By linking the cost of non-disclosures to the outcomes associated with those disclosures, the indirect regulatory approach can induce greater transparency. But at the same time, this indirect approach also offers a more flexible approach for firms to decide what information, how much information, and in what method they need to provide to the investors. The empirical evidence from analysis of the SOP voting supports the effectiveness of the indirect disclosure regulation as a mechanism to induce greater, um, greater disclosures. So I want to stop there. And I would like to thank you all for giving your views, uh, especially uh, Lee Xu. Uh, thank you very much for your question. I very much appreciate it. And I do appreciate your comments as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Prof. Chiba, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, it's really uh, a very interesting paper. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there another questions? If anyone uh, have any questions, you can open your mic and ask uh, your question. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, just uh, brief uh, presentation. Uh, actually, you devote uh, time and you share it as uh, new experiences. And uh, I really appreciate your efforts that you exert on your uh, on this presentation concerning shareholder voting. Uh, uh, just uh, actually, I wrote uh, the comment on chat. Actually, uh, then uh, I need a certificate of uh, participation. So, if possible, there is there is no there is no certificate. There is uh, no certificate. Yeah. I think that's answer for Mohammed, not for me. Yes. So uh, there are another questions. Uh, I think that uh, you have done uh, very well answering a lot of questions there, uh, dear Professor uh, Chiva. Yeah. Uh, so thank but you. Before much. I go, Lee Shu, can you just uh, tell me which university are you from? I appreciate your comments a lot. Okay, very nicely thought through, very thoughtful. They are actually very helpful. That's why I'm asking. Oh, yeah, I'm from Washington State University. Oh, very good. Okay, good. Nice to meet you. You are very welcome. Yeah. And thanks for your comments again. Very appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, yeah, goodbye. I hope to see you soon in Egypt, dear prof. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Love yeah. to come there one day. It's true. Yeah, yeah. Goodbye. Bye.